So uh, I'm very excited to be here. And uh, the reason is uh, uh, almost 16, 17 years ago when I was an undergrad student uh, at IIT Kharagpur, at that time, uh, I was interested in, as it happens with undergrads, like a lot, lot of different topics and I was trying to explore. And somehow I fell in love with uh, this field called natural language processing. I thought, you know, it's fascinating how languages work and I got introduced to this totally new area of field called linguistics in the process. And it was fascinating how linguistics can be used to, you know, uh, in computation and you can make great systems with it. And now I can proudly say that, you know, 16, 17 years ago when AI was not a celebrity, I started working on it and now suddenly five years ago, AI is everywhere and uh, hence people like me are going and giving keynotes. Uh, but it's not that, uh, you know, I have done great things in AI or um, it's, it's just a collective effort that somehow AI has become great in recent times. And in this talk, my aim, uh, so I know uh, what the whole program is about and I have seen and you will hear a lot of talks uh, related to how you, know, you can do dev uh, using various AI platforms and stuff like that. But I'm here representing more uh, AI researcher than you know, Microsoft, so I'm not going to talk about Microsoft technology as such. I will probably at the end, if I get some time for two, three minutes, talk about the kind of work we do. Uh, and I'm also not going to talk about, uh, you know, what all things you can do with AI. In fact, you all know about what all things you can do with AI, right? And thanks to Levant, because he already explained most of the things I have there, games, speech-to-speech, -speech, translation, all the feats that we had, AI had recently in all these areas. So I'm not going to repeat. What rather I'm going to uh, talk about is this that how much of it is hype and how much of this is reality. And again, let me quote Levant here. He said a very beautiful thing. He said 50% of the companies actually use AI but don't know whether it is useful, unsure of, right? That's something somewhere is wrong there. Why would you use something when you don't even know whether it's going to be useful? So there is certainly some bit of hype there. So, at, but 50% of the rest of the companies, the other 50% probably are using AI and assured that it's helping them. And he gave lots of examples. You, I'm sure, know a lot of examples of why, where AI is helpful. So AI is also helpful. So the point is, where is the hype and where is the reality? And understanding that thin line is, I think, very diff important for all of us here. And that's what I'm going to try to pinpoint. Uh, now, this person, Subarao Kambapati, he is the president of AAAI. Uh, AAAI is one of the you know, umbrella organization for AI researchers in the world. And in this year's AAAI um, uh, conference, in his presidential address, this happened last month, February 8th or 9th, uh, he presented a very beautiful talk, which is there on you know, YouTube. I encourage all of you to go. You can just search with Subarao AAAI presidential talk. It will come up. Very beautiful talk, almost along the lines of what I am going to tell today. But I want to specifically quote him on this slide. So he says, you, know, you hear these things like AI is the new electricity. Andrew Ng said that. AI is, and Sundar Pichai comes and says, AI is bigger than fire and electricity. And somebody then says AI is God. So AI is certainly everything. Uh, AI is useful everywhere. So he quotes some smart electronic toothbrush that provides real-time feedback in improving brushing habits and all. So you can hear AI to be you know, incorporated in all kinds of things. And then, of course, Elon, there is Elon Musk who says AI is a bigger threat than Korea. Robots are there. They are going to take over. And these are the kinds of questions we get asked as AI researchers all the time. So yesterday I was in uh, Airbus, uh, the company Airbus, uh, in a panel discussion on Women's Day, and the question was, can AI reduce gender gap? And the whole panel unanimously agreed that AI can't do anything. It's humans who have to do the thing, right? So AI just amplifies human intention. If humans are biased, then AI can't do anything. So, so that's precisely the point. The uh, point is that, uh, well, AI can do a lot of things, but it has limitations also. And it's very important to understand what AI can do and what AI cannot do. And uh, that will give you a very good, fund, you know, strong foundation for you know, setting the expectations right. 
So here is a uh, nice report that came out, I think, about a year ago, 2017 January, from uh, Business Insider. The report is from McKinsey. So they did a survey. They asked various AI experts two questions. So they divided the different uh, you know, cognitive and intelligent capabilities of humans into sensory, cognitive, natural language processing, social and emotional, and physical capabilities, and asked the experts that in each of them, where do you think AI is today? And how do you think the timeline is? So here you see three kinds of things. So yellow means uh, the AI system just does good as you know, median human performance, average human performance. Green means it is in top quartile. So in speech, you know it's already green. In image recognition, it's already green. AI can beat human. Uh, and red means it's actually below median. So AI is not close to humans. And then here, they are making predictions. So 2020 is here. So uh, this blue dot, the end blue dot tells you when the median performance or the top quartile performance will be achieved. So, so gray is the median, uh, and this blue is the top quartile. So you see the hardest of the problems are these. So by tw only by 2070 experts are predicting we will solve this. And what are these? So these reds are all social and emotional reasoning. Any kind of social and emotional reasoning is very hard. Language is very hard, so I'm very happy because I have a job secured as a researcher for several years to come till I retire. Uh, uh, so that's also sometime, sometime 2050s and 60s. And then anything related to creativity is very hard, right? So these are the problems which are very hard. So what I thought I will try to tell you in this talk, and uh, of course we as researchers are also trying to understand why these are harder problems. And, how can we solve them? That's the research, right? How do you solve these problems? But what I am trying to t t tell you in this talk is these three things. So what makes these problems, natural language understanding, social and emotional reasoning, some of the hardest problems in AI? What's so fundamental about them, which is not there for say, speech recognition or image? Somehow speech and image should be easier problems than this then. What makes it easier? And then we know that deep learning has revolutionized. So speech is solved, vision is solved only because of deep learning. So how can deep learning help there and where deep learning cannot help? And uh, I'm specifically talking about deep learning, but you can ask the same question about machine learning in general. And uh, last part is, you know, is it even necessary to make AI systems which can reason emotionally and socially? I mean, that's a very important question, right? We, are we trying to make you know, human clones using AI? Uh, what would be use of such human clones? And, and that's the kind of goal which drives people crazy that it will take over all jobs, you know, it will take over the humanity. But if we don't make them, and first of all, do we need them? Why do you need them? So that's the last question I'm going to ask you. Uh, ask. So the first part, I'm talking about the limits of AI, the second part, Yes, we do solve some of these problems very, can solve some of these problems very well, so feeds and caveats at the end that, you know, do we really want to solve this problem? What are the problems we are really interested in solving or we should be really interested in solving? So I'm going to quote L L Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein to start with. So he says something very interesting. He's, he says, you know, he was a philosopher of language and he tried to characterize human language, and I'm rephrasing him, he did not say it exactly the same way. So if you think of what AI can solve today, so AI beats human in chess, AI beats human in black gammon, what's common to these things are there is a well-defined rule, set of rule in chess, right? Both the players should follow those rules. So it's a very well-defined problem. And there's a very well-defined you know, end goal. You know, you have to, uh, in chess, you know what kind of board positions mean that the bot has won. So these are very well-defined problems. So these are games where the rules are fixed. What he says is language is also a game. Every time, emotions, language, social interactions, these are all games, but the rules are not fixed. The rules are always keep evolving. So it's a moving target. And I will elucidate it a lot more with examples in a moment. But then what's interesting is, you know, a lot of people have said this before, and I'm just quoting two of the most uh, foundational ones. So Alan Turing in 1950s, when he started th talking about can machines think, he said that's a bad question to ask. Because, you know, it's very hard to define what is thinking. So let's 
make the question easier, let's say can machine imitate as if it is thinking. So imitation game. And he proposed the famous Turing test, which is the test for AI. And till date, I mean, although you would have read news that you know somebody, some machine has passed Turing test, frankly, it's a very you know limited setup. You, you can go and read exactly in what kind of setting it has passed Turing test. It's not exactly the setup which Turing had said. So, um, so Turing in 1950 formulated this problem, and it still remains an open challenge. And Bill Gates very recently again said the same thing. So I will say that the biggest breakthrough in AI happens when, like humans, it can go and read the, the read books, read the data in the internet, and can reason about them. So what both of them, who are you know more than half a century apart, are trying to say is the same thing: that the fundamental problem that I would uh, you know it, that AI should solve is linguistic reasoning, language understanding and conversation. And uh, unless it can't solve this, we can't say that we have what is called artificial general intelligence. So in a sense, language understanding is almost equivalent of artificial general intelligence, which is almost equivalent of what we call AI complete problem. Now the thing that comes close to it is not chess. Chess might be a very hard game, and we might all you know, be at awe with you know, Gary Kasparov or any chess player who is great. But still, actually, it's very easy compared to, let's say, something which comes close to it is self-driving cars. And especially if there is a self-driving car for India. So if you can design a self-driving car for India, which where the rules of the game evolves all the time, right? US is easier, I would say, rules are still fixed. Here we define the rules. For each road, there is a different rule each signal. There is a different rule each time. So if you can solve it, then we would say, OK, AI has really come to a stage where it can probably take over human. Uh, but we are nowhere close to it. So I will take language as an example and try to explain why the rules of the games are not fixed and how they keep changing all the time. Right? So what makes language understanding hard is that uh, it requires a no lot of knowledge. A part of this knowledge comes from what we call this linguistic knowledge. So like you have to know all the words in the language. You have to know the idioms, proverbs, metaphors, etc. But then the bigger problem is that's not enough. You need to have a knowledge of the world, right? So if I say I am a heavy metal fan, so what do you think? I, you, you can imagine a heavy metal fan, table fan sitting at a corner of a room. So am I saying that, or am I referring to some music genre? So you have to have that world knowledge, right? That's what is common sense about. Uh, we need a lot of contextual knowledge. So the same statement said in different contexts might mean totally different things. And there are sociocultural norms. Uh, and I will give examples of these in a moment. So I think a lot of you might have seen these joke before. So um, the joke is as follows. Three, uh, no, sorry, two um, scientists, chemists, they go in a restaurant. The first one says, oh, I'm a chemist, so I will just have some H2O. The other one says, I will have some H2O too. And then the bartender brings two drinks. The first leaves, the second one dies. And the joke is because H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide, and therefore it dies. I mean, you drink hydrogen peroxide, that you die. Now, there's an interesting you know, take on this joke, which came out recently on social media. And the, the, this particular take says this. Two scientists walk into the bar, blah, blah happens. But bartender gives them water because the bartender is able to distinguish between the boundary tones that dictate the grammatical function and the blah blah as well as the pragmatic context. So both of them live. So pragmatic context is important, right? Uh, so if somebody says H2O2 in a restaurant, probably he is also asking for water and not hydrogen peroxide. So if the bartender is smart, he will reason it in this way. And this kind of situation, this is not a joke, it happens all the time. So our language is full of what we call communicative uh, you know, intent. So when we say, could you please pass the salt, the answer to that is not, yes, I can. right? But that would be a valid, linguistically valid answer. The answer to that is really passing the salt. So we say things very differently than what we mean. So another example is when I you know, say uh, somebody, happy new year, or happy women's day, or something. Uh, what am I trying to do? 
Am I saying, oh, I really wish my intent is that your new year should be happy and, you know, unless uh, I wish, it may not be happy. I have great power that my, my wishes always come true. None of these, right? It's just politeness. It's just a way of expressing politeness and warmth. That's it, right? So all the things that we use in language have three layers of information. One is the surface level information. One is the, you know, uh, uh, what we call the pragmatic information, which is the intent, like I'm trying to be polite and all. And there is a third layer, which is the social information. So I might say, you know, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year, friend, versus Happy New Year, yar. Happy New Year, dost. So if I just use the word yar or dost, nothing changes in the information content or the linguistic content or pragmatic intent. I'm still being polite. What changes is I'm trying to connect to you as a fellow Indian or a fellow speaker of English. So that's a social identity. So there are multiple layers and we all the time use language with information goals, pragmatic goals, as well as social goals. And the social functions are pretty hard to actually model. So you have things like politeness, formality, and all these things are very socio-culturally you know, dependent. So what is polite in India is, in, in Indian English may not be what is polite in American English, or what is polite in British English. And here goes an example. So this is anybody from, uh, I mean, anybody who is a British here. So I'm not offending anybody, I hope. So this is again another joke. So how British say things, how people mean it, and actually what uh, they mean. So when they say, OK, quite good, so essentially mm, what they mean is a bit disappointing. But people actually mean that, I mean, if you're not aware of British culture, you'd probably think that it's, uh, they are meaning quite good. So, well, these are stereotyping. We do believe these are stereotyping, right? Uh, every, every British in every context may not be using it in this way. But the, there is some truth behind this stereotyping, which is language is very context specific, uh, very geography specific. The same English language in different geographies are used in very different ways. Okay. Uh, so what is the repercussion of all these? So the repercussion of all this is that you, you know, we have this bunch of chatbots coming in. So I have put most of these um, chatbot companies are Indian startups. And uh, they are supposed to be some of the best chatbots around uh, from India today. Uh, they are doing excellent jobs. But if you see where they are useful is, uh, for instance, this Ixigo is a travel chatbot. So it works very well in travel domain. Or, um, you know, so, so this LX is a smart assistant, so it helps you schedule your meeting, et cetera. So whenever you have a specific vertical, a very narrow domain, and you want to build a chatbot, and uh, the, it, it just tries to solve a particular task for you, the set of tasks are very well defined, like chess, think chess. If you can define something as game of chess, you are done, you can do it. It's still not easy, by the way. I mean, you still have to do a lot of work. And uh, things like Bot Framework or Bot Studio from Microsoft or the Alexa APIs from Amazon will help you do it much faster today, if you are doing it for English, by the way. If you are doing it for some other language, then uh, let's say Canada, you are still stuck, because the Bot Framework would not have much to offer for Canada. But nevertheless, you can do it. But if you want to build something like Roo, so Roo is a Microsoft uh, chatbot which uh, doesn't solve any particular task. It's an entertainer. It's like your friend. And it's on Facebook. You can go and add, and it will talk to you. It looks fantastically you know, advanced. So, and, and I will come back to this point. That's the problem of humans. They are very easy to fool. So uh, it looks fa fantastically good. It uh, you know, converse with you very nicely, and it will connect to you because uh, it's, it's, it can use English and all these kinds of things. But then you will see after two or three turns that it makes no sense. It's the most stupidest thing you would have ever conversed with. But still, people love to chat with it, right? Uh, the reason people love to chat with it is, I mean, at least uh, I would think, nobody knows. These are open problems. So we are trying to do some research on why people like to you know, talk to chatbot, what kind of chatbots open-ended chatbots people would like to talk to. But it seems people are fascinated by the fact that it can even you know, talk to you 
in you know human like way and this is if you are interested in trivia this is uh, called the eliza effect based on the name called eliza which was a counselor and it was uh, the person who designed Feigenbaum from MIT he thought it's the most stupid thing and he didn't want to put it out but when it was put out people just thought it was a great AI thing same the Emturk example right even though humans were playing the chess people thought oh still actually it looks like a machine so Eliza effect in general means that people are very very um, when it comes to technology people get impressed too quickly and if something is even remotely human they think wow we have solved the problem and and that's one of the things that happen is happening right now eliza effect at a larger scale so so what essentially i'm trying to say is when your task is very well defined you can build chatbots today but uh, when it's an open ended chatbot it's still a far very far away goal and the reason is all the pragmatic context that we use every time we talk all the social context we use and these chatbots cannot have uh, cannot keep those contexts um, so so I, I don't want to sound too negative or too pessimistic yes we can solve lots of problems today and uh, let me switch gears and try to tell you what what we can do really well today uh, so how has deep learning helped in let's say building chatbots or neural systems uh, or, or other kinds of NLP systems by the way Roo is a kind of a neural chatbot so it's trained on human human chat data and that's why you know on a shorter conversation context it, it looks amazingly human because it has learned to you know how humans talk but it doesn't have the longer context which we human have uh, when we talk to other people so uh, so for instance one thing which other than speech one thing that has it has revolutionized deep learning is machine translation so uh, machine translation systems are measured using something called blue score uh, how accurate they are and the older systems uh, which was called statistical machine translation system uh, they even no matter how much data you trained it with the blue score went to a certain level let's say 40 out of 100 and stopped there but the newer systems the blue score can go to 50 60 and it keeps increasing as you pump in more data and these are neural systems so there it certainly has helped Although there are, you know, catches like it does not help much with languages like English and German, whereas it helps a lot with languages like Japanese and English. Any idea why not in English and German, but Japanese and English it helps a lot? So English and German are much closer languages in terms of syntactic properties, etc. So even the statistical empty systems do very well. So neural systems are not adding any much benefit to it. Whereas Japanese and English are very different languages. So uh, it's like English and Hindi, right? So the, in Hindi, the verb comes at the end, whereas in English, the verb comes in the middle. So the same verb, if a sentence is long, uh, might be like 20 words away from each other when you align the two sentences. Now, neural systems has this very great ability to remember large contexts, like RNNs and all. So they can remember large context, which it's harder for statistical machine translation systems to do. But if they are almost one-to-one -one aligned, then neural systems give no much benefit over statistical machine translation systems. Uh, so, so this is, I thought this was important because you need to know why something works also, right? When something works and uh, whether it will be useful or not. Um, so in general, Neural networks are what we call universal approximators. So it can learn any continuous function very well. And speech or image is kind of a continuous function. Whereas things which are not continuous function, like language, language is discrete. And I will, uh, I have an example, I think. Uh, OK, I will see if I have an example later mm, to explain what a continu uh, continuous and uh, discrete system is. So two fundamental benefits of deep learning that it has given to NLP is one is, I already said, modeling very large context. So in that sense, for chatbots also, we have more hope because if we can store the conversation context for a very long conversation, we can do very well. Um, the second thing is it, it gives us a way of m modeling discrete space into a continuous space. So words are mapped into a continuous space, which uh, we, do, we call word embeddings. 
and word embeddings are um, very, very useful. They, they are actually revolutionizing the way NLP works. Uh, although none of these ideas are new though. So original idea of word embedding is from 1957, but at that time it was used, the way we solved it was different. We used something called vector space models. Now we use neural models. Um, but some of the problems which are really in, uh, you know, hard, and right now people are working on it, is, as I said, if you have a chatbot and a long chat logs, you could learn from that. But unfortunately, remember that every, uh, you know, you are learning from human-human chat. So if you look at a long context, essentially you are specifically learning about th those particular people who are talking. You are not learning the generic principles. It's harder to learn the generic principles it, the more context you look at, right? So, uh, and, and especially with neural networks where you do not give, it, they don't need features, external features. Uh, so the question is then how to integrate external knowledge source. So, so in this conversation, the two people were A and B, now C and D are talking, and you know about C things like where C studies, how old C is, where C lives, etc. How can you use it in, let's say, Roo, so that Roo can have a more meaningful conversation with C? So how you integrate external knowledge sources, how to store, you know, whatever you learn during the conversation about the person, how do you explicitly learn and store that knowledge so that you can use it later? So if you say right now that I'm from Bangalore, I should not ask that question again where you are from. So these kind of things. And of course, all these things boil down to how do you knowledge over, uh, sorry, reason over a knowledge base. But, but the fundamental problem is for all of these things you need data. And uh, neural networks have worsened the problem in a sense. So this is how NLP has evolved over the times, from the time of Turing till 80s, NLP was mostly rule-based. So it's like linguistic rules and people came up with rules and, uh, and with very little data you could make systems work, almost no data. In 1990s came the first generation of statistical you know, NLP systems. And you required a lot of insightful features so still linguists were needed who gave what features are useful to you know, process this data. Should I look at the parts of speech? Should I look at what is subject, what is object, etc.? So those kind of things. Um, so you, but you need some data because it learned from statistical systems. From 2000 onwards, we had this large scale, you know, big data revolution and more large scale SMT systems where features were important but less, slightly less important. But then with 2010, with deep learning, people now talk of only data, right? And the numbers go like this. So uh, let's take the example of, uh, let's say, machine translation. Uh, in 1950s to 1980s, we had machine translation systems which were purely rule-based. So we did not need any data to train the system. The only data that was required is the amount of data the linguist would require to understand the rules. So the linguist would. And, and if the linguists knew both the languages, let's say English and French, they could just think about the rules in their head also and just verify it with the data. Uh, so you didn't need much data. The first generation systems required around 10,000 to 100,000 parallel sentences. Parallel sentences means sentence, uh, a sentence and its translation in the other language. This is what you train a machine translation system with. Uh, in, uh, with the big data revolution that went to, let's say, 1 million to 10 million. But uh, with deep learning, even with 1 million sentence pairs, you don't do much well, m much better. So actually, you go to 100 million sentences, maybe billions of sentence pairs, right? And Levant, talk, during his talk, said there's a lot and lot of training data. Is it really true? Well, in some domain, yes, but not for language. So all languages do not have data. And the, data, the amount of data that's generated uh, in such great speed over social media and other sources is not, again, same for all languages. So um, this uh, study I did in 2008, there is a, um, there is a particular uh, place called Linguistic Data Consortium where you can find most of the data that academics have built. Some of the you know, company data, like Microsoft also contribute, we contributed some data back to LDC. So it's a good place to look at, to get an estimate of how much data is available in various languages. And I plotted how much data in terms of number of millions of words available in the languages. 
So this is the highest and it's a rank plot. So this is the second, this is the third, this is the fourth and it drops. And you see this is a log logarithmic scale. So that both the y-axis and x-axis is a logarithmic scale. So it basically drops very drastically. It's a power law. So if it was not a log scale, it would drop like this, right? And the four languages which seem to be what we call language data rich are English, Chinese, Spanish, and Arabic. Any idea why? Any connection do you see between these four languages, English, Chinese, Spanish, and Arabic? So my hypothesis is these are the languages which either US speaks or US fears. <laughs> so, uh, so a lot of uh, investment has been made for these languages and a lot of data has been created. But if you look at in uh, Hindi, it probably, it's, Hindi is the most resourced Indian language, but it, the amount of resource Hindi has would be one hundredth of that in English, typically. And the amount of resource Kannada has will be probably one hundredth of Hindi. So you can imagine if English has today one billion, Hindi will have one million. Actually, English has, uh, the ratio is a uh, thousand probably. So Hindi has one million and then Kannada would have 10,000 parallel sentences with English. And forget about, I mean, can think of the number of speakers of Kannada you have. Uh, forget about, I mean, if you talk of Konkani, if you talk of Tulu, they, they are nowhere in the scene. And would they ever come to the scene? I doubt. I mean, uh, can we take the questions later? Um, so we have around 6,000 languages in the world. A lot of them are critically endangered. India itself has around 1,000 languages. And a uh, little bit of data and systems that we have from Google, Microsoft, and some other companies like Reverie and all are only concentrated in, on, with the top 10 or 12 Indian languages today. And the number is 1,000. So we, I don't see any hope of you know, getting technology to all the people. And, and the number of people speaking those languages is huge. Probably the number of Tulu speakers is more than the number of, let's say, um, uh, Polish speakers in the world. But Polish will, I'm sure, have more resources than Tulu, a lot, lot more resources than Tulu. Uh, so, so this is one very, very strong problem in NLP that NLP is facing today. And I uh, cannot overemphasize this because being in India, I hear a lot from startups that, you know, can we build a chatbot for Canada? Can we build a chatbot for Hindi? Can we build a system for English, etc.? And the answer to this is yes, the technology exists. You can build, if it's a vertical domain, narrow domain, you can do it. But then you have to collect the data, unfortunately. And that's a lot of work. So, so I, uh, now I'm, I will just summarize all the things that I have said in terms of you know, what you should be aware of when you are trying to build useful AI system. What are the kind of problems you would really lo love to solve? So I will quote, quote Subarao again here. So he, he says in the same talk that our systems seem happiest either far away from you know, humans, like when uh, the Mars rover and things like that, or when they're in adversarial stance. But when it has to interact with humans, that's when all the problems come up. But that's the case which we want to solve, right? So the kind of problems we want to solve is when AI systems can help humans. And the thing to understand here is AI is a tool. AI is just a tool. And again, I would quote, uh, you know, refer to Levant here. He showed that nice slide with, you know, uh, chips and then on top of it libraries and on top of it platforms, etc., etc. That's precisely what AI is. It just gives you a lot of things that you can do, but it's not the problem you are trying to solve, unless you are an AI researcher. Unless you are an AI researcher, you will be actually using AI to solve some other problem. And most of the time, almost never, AI is the solution, complete solution. It's only part of the complete solution. So what's important is you have to understand, you know, what kind of problem you are solving. And usually, you know, when, uh, so I, I will take again chatbot as an example. When somebody comes to me and says, you know, can we build a chatbot for, I have a startup on, let's say, um, something to do with schools. And can I build a chatbot that will talk to parents and teachers and all? The point is, do you really need that chatbot, right? Is, is conversation the best medium? Of course, we had, if we had very good chatbot, then natural language is the most natural medium of communication. 
but it need not be i mean given that we are not doing we do not have technology that's extremely good there might be some other simpler ui that might do well as well and the reason why people i mean and i don't blame the people who think that chatbots can be a good medium uh, i mean a good uh, interface they can be but unfortunately they don't know how hard it is to build chatbots if especially if it's not in english so um, so in most of the cases right ai should collaborate with humans rather than compete and the two has very you know different skills we have already seen ai does very well in continuous function in games where rules are fixed in perceptual abilities ai does horribly when it comes to social and emotional reasoning when it comes to you know pragmatic and linguistic reasoning so why don't we leave the linguistic emotional social reasoning to humans and ask the ais to do other kinds of things so for instance image processing or speech recognition which it can do better so so partitioning the problem into what ai should do and what human should do is very useful and having human in the loop is often the most successful system uh and then as i said users are usually very very forgiving so mm, users usually are cooperative they are awed by you know any little things ai can do so you should leverage on that you know so uh, i mean it's i mean i'm not saying you should fool your users but since users are cooperative they will try to not break your system but try to work with the system to arrive at a common end goal and uh, to be productive so you should try to you know leverage on that also coming to data again it can't be over emphasized so data is the new electricity but as i said you know most of the time you will be investing on if you are into an AI, in an ai company or building some solution based on ai is actually collecting data so you should invest and innovate on collecting data you should think of technologies which can you know uh work on low resource data sets so not like things which are very data hungry depending data hungry so depending on how much data you have you should choose the technology that you want to use very judiciously and you you make the trade off how much you want to invest on collecting data and how much you invest on making a low resource technology that uh, so so if you are limited by data rather go to a low resource technology and and one thing is very important that data exists but there are huge amount of privacy issues around data only recently we have started making all this noise but it will be even more and more important in the future so you have to be very careful about this and data is often very very biased so there are all sorts of human biases which are there in the data and uh, how many of you have heard about tay the chatbot that microsoft had released not many of you so let me see how i'm doing on time yeah so maybe uh, i don't have much things to add so maybe i can quickly tell you about tay so uh, tay was a twitter chatbot that microsoft released on twitter and uh, probably 2 years ago and it was supposed to learn from human you know tweets and the conversations it had with other humans and it wrote back uh, you know replied tweeted and so on within 48 hours microsoft had to take it down and the reason microsoft had to take it down was it had become racist and sexist and was telling all sorts of obnoxious things and what was its only fault there was no bug in the code the fa the fault was it was too good it learned from humans very well so if humans are racist then it will be racist so that was the major problem i mean of course humans are not always that racist there was more to the story there was a concerted effort etc etc to break it but but uh, that's the point that if the data is biased and there are lots and lots of examples of you know google ads going wrong google suggestions going wrong you know things becoming racist and all it's only because humans are biased so how do you take bias out of it is a very very important problem and you don't want to get into sticky situations like this right as a startup or as any company uh and if you collect some data it's always a good idea to contribute back in whatever form and whatever amount you can and especially for indian languages this is very very true there is so little data in indian languages out there that if you can contribute back anything to do with indian language indian driving scenarios etc it would be very very helpful and and last but not the least is you have to understand the problem so even though you do not need to give features to the neural network so probably you don't have to be a linguist to you know solve an nlp problem today 
still you need to understand who your users are, what exactly uh, you know, the benefit of AI is for your particular class of users. And this is a very multidisciplinary thing. You have to think very broadly. So you need people who can think in terms of design, human computer interaction, and, and ethnography and sociology, because as I said, every geography is different. So ethnographers study cultures. So in this particular culture, what will fly, what will not fly, what will work, and, and of course market research. So you have to understand your user and the problem very well, and then only you can solve it. And AI can certainly help, but you have to know where exactly you have to put it. Um, so I will just use uh, the last two minutes probably to give an idea about one particular project that we have been doing in uh, our lab for last five years, which is all about this, that how do you understand the problem in a particular context? So the context I'm talking of is India specifically, but world over in general. The context is that of multilingual societies. So what happens in multilingual societies is we always very naturally mix language. So in India, nobody would speak pure Hindi. So imagine that Microsoft is trying to make a Cortana for Hindi. So you are going to make a speech recognition for, recognizer for Hindi. So you collect data of Hindi speech, let's say conversation speech, etc., etc., which is only Hindi, and try to train a system and deploy it. And you would see that the next day it is failing on every single input. The reason is people will not say, you know, Aaj Hyderabad ka mausam kaisa hai. People will say, Aaj Hyderabad ka weather kaisa hai. Right? So that's the more natural way of saying it. So in multilingual societies, people almost very naturally mix languages. And unless you live in a very multilingual society, you probably won't realize that. The thing though is it happens not only in India. In India, it's an extreme case. We even mix like three languages at a time in a single sentence. But it does happen around the world. So this, these are real tweets. The first one is, I think, Norwegian and English, or Swedish and English mixed. This is Indonesian and English mixed. And this is French and Arabic mixed. So, so this kind of mixing happens a lot around the world. It's called code mixing. So um, interestingly, 50% of the world's population is multilingual. So this is a very real and big problem, even though strangely, until very recently, so we started working on this five years ago. So until that time, it was only there are two, three papers in computational sides of things. And linguists have, have, of course, been working on it. But from technology side, there has been absolutely nothing on this. So this shows how blind and you know, tunneled vision we are when it comes to technology. What works, we, th we only keep working on that, but forget about what all things are needed. Uh, and, and people code switch for a variety of reasons, and this itself is very interesting to understand. So for instance, in one of the studies, we saw that in Twitter, Hindi-English bilinguals tweet in Hindi. So there is a very strong correlation with Hindi tweets and negative emotion, abusing, whereas a very strong positive correlation of English tweets with you know, positive emotion. Now, sociolinguistically, it's fascinating, but even technologically, it's very important. Because if you are doing social media analytics and avoiding all the Hindi tweets because your system can only handle English tweets, 70% of Indian users tweet in, I mean, 70% of tweets coming from India are in English. So you can say majority is English and I can do analytics and I will be fine. But you won't be fine because your picture will be much more positive than it actually is. Because the negatives will be more in the Hindi side of things, right? Or the Indian language side of things. So these kind of implications are very important to understand. So this is our group. We call it Project Melange. And in fact, Kalika and Sunena are just sitting here, uh, Kalika Sunena. And um, we have been working on various aspects of this. And right now, we have a speech recognizer that can work for English, Hindi-English mixed speech. Uh, we have also worked on translation a little bit. And we have language. You know, the first thing you have to solve is language detection. So we have uh, at word level. That, I mean, you would be surprised that even that was a new problem. Nobody had looked at it. So we tried to do that for quite, uh, you know, two, three years. And now we have a very good language detector, et cetera. So let me stop with that and just say again that, you know, you have to understand the problem. Don't get carried away by hype. Yes, AI can help, but only when you know how to use it and where to use it. You can ask. Maybe I will repeat. Mm-hmm.
So, so the question is, uh, when I say language resource in that graph, what I really meant and counted. So uh, I LDC, is, broadly speaking, there are um, two kinds of resources. One is data sets, and data sets can be annotated or unannotated. So an annotated uh, data set could be you have sentences and their parse trees. Linguists have hand coded the parse trees and all. That's one kind of annotation. There are various kinds of annotations. A, a raw data set would be like you just have a corpus, let's say, uh, 20 million Hindi, uh, you know, essays. I mean, words collected from Wikipedia or essays or whatever. So that's raw data set. And speech also same. You can have raw speech. You have transcribed speech and so on. So that's one set of resources, and that's the most uh, very very important resources, and that's what I counted here. But there is another set of resources, which is these basic APIs or tools, like uh, you know, part of speech tagger, morphological analyzer, or intent detector, etc. Those are also very important. And again, in English, you have a lot of them. But uh, in Indian languages, maybe a few very basic tools for some languages. But yeah, I counted the data when I said resources. Right. So, so no. So the LDC data. So usually, when people contribute data, they have some, you know, uh, quality control. So they will say, okay, this is pure Hindi, etc. So for our purposes, we had to collect data. So Microsoft had to go and collect data where you have casual conversation of English and Hindi mixed. But it's not hard because you know when we went and collected data for Hindi. It turned out they were naturally mixing English. But then we had to sit and transcribe. I mean, we had to hire people who would sit and transcribe that this is an English word, and this, this is a Hindi word, and what the word is. They will type all the words. So, so that's why data collection is such a painstaking process. It's not only recording the speech, but after recording the speech, you have to transcribe the, each word, right, what the word is, and stuff like that. Yes. So, uh, Man Manojit, one question. So, I think you mentioned that uh, speech uh, is something where AI, AI can really help, right? Because it's like continuous. Uh, but if you look at uh, from a layman's perspective, you know, like uh, language uh, versus speech. You know, speech is actually a vocalization of the language, right? So, how come the two end up being so different? You know, when you speak words, actually. Uh, you know, you can also say there are gaps and, you know, breaks in the words, right? Couldn't the same technique be applied to the language as well? Yeah. So, so that's an excellent question, actually. So uh, it's a historical divide. So when people say speech, they mostly mean from the, you know, audio getting the text or from the text getting the audio. And, and this also has nuances, like you might ask a question um, or, or make a comment, and the change will be not in the words, but in how you say it, right? Intonation and all. So there are nuances and enough interesting problems. But people mostly talk about that, uh, you know, from speech to text or text to speech. Whereas when we say NLP, we are saying from text to meaning. So that is the harder problem. So when I say speech is easy, I don't mean from speech to meaning. That's much hard because that is speech plus NLP. So that that's just a, I mean, way of. Uh, dividing the communities. Sure, makes sense. Uh, maybe Thanks. one last question. There. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm. Uh, I have a question about uh, RNNs. When you talked about that, so. A lot of language models that are being built today, they are based on RNNs, as you Correct. said. Uh, but if we want the context, why do we not uh, model it as a belief-based uh, problem? Because beliefs also uh, encode all the context in them, right? And that's how we humans think as well. We think probabilistically, like, this is what you're trying to say right now, and then I'll try to infer. Mm. So why is there this fascination with RNNs? What are the challenges with uh, hidden models, partial observable models? Why are people not like, uh, trying too many of them. OK. So again, an excellent question. And I'm not fascinated by RNN, by the way. So, um, so yes, um, uh, most of the 
you know, real bots that work, let's say Cortana or, uh, you know, Siri, the RNNs and all doesn't come into how the bot reason. So those might come in the, you know, language processing, the speech processing part and all. But the bot still reasons using states. So there are partially observable, so POM DP kind of things and stuff like that, right? And, and what people are going more and more towards is this reinforcement learning kind of paradigms because uh, those uh, provide, uh, so, so the problem of dialogue systems inherently is how do you evaluate them? Because the dialogue is, it's not like translation that one input and one output. And even translation is hard because the output can be, one sentence can be translated in infinitely many ways. So how do you know whether it's right? But dialogue is depending on what the user said, it will be completely taking different paths. So therefore, uh, reinforcement learning kind of paradigms and then POMDP kind of paradigms are much more suitable. So I think the only reason people are fascinated by RNNs is if your problem is just predict the next word, which is what language models typically try to do, then RNNs do very well. You know, predict the next character, predict the next word, uh, provided it learns from enough data. The S uh, statistical language models start saturating after a point, but RNNs seem to remember longer context. So statistical language models will be some n-grams, right? So you look at you know, three previous words or five previous words. But RNNs are not like that. It looks from the beginning of the sentence till this point. And therefore, they are better at predicting the next word. But if you want to reason over that, I still think RNNs are not useful. OK. So, yeah. so, so the work that you're doing in your lab on Hinglish, hmm. um, how, how does that incorporate uh, these uh, states and POMDPs? Um, so we haven't come to a dialogue system yet. We are just working on that. So right now in the dialogue system space, we are trying to understand even does it make sense to code switch? In a, so should, let's say, Roo code switch? And uh, I, I mean, it's not a published result yet, but the initial study shows that it's very, very user dependent. Some users, uh, I, like the Eliza effect, just says, wow, it can code switch, and I don't care what it says, but it's saying English. But some users are very particular. They say, hey, uh, it's trying to code switch, but the output is all garbage, and I don't want it. And some users might even not understand Hindi uh, interacting with Indians. So our first study shows that it's very important to identify who the user is. And probably the corresponding strategy would be what we call nudging. So like you do with humans, right? So if you don't know whether the other person is willing to talk to you in English, you will just put one Hindi word and watch the other person. If the other person reciprocates with more Hindi words, and then we will move to Hindi. But you'll start with English. So something similar. We are so those will be the states then, right? So you are mod modeling a belief over the user that what category of user this is, and trying to use that, and uh, the estimate of the belief changes as you interact. So we are trying to use those models, but it's too early stage of research. But we do use RNN for language modeling for speech recognition, and there it really helps, actually. Thank you. Okay, thank you.